Thanks, Dr. Katungal. Are there any empty seats? I see a couple people flooding the hallway. Does anybody have an empty seat next to them? Okay, I see two. If anyone wants to go to the words, the back corner, I'm going to just organize this for a second. <laughs> three. Oh, okay, I'm seeing three. <laughs> I feel like an auctioneer now. <laughs> So I want to say, well, you're getting settled, um, my really sincere thanks to, to JP and to Anne-Marie and to Carmen for all of the organizational work of putting this together. As it always does, um, the series is, uh, looks excellent. And I'm really honored and humbled to be speaking as part of it. And I'm so glad that you're all here with me. So today I want to talk to you about a problem that's been haunting my research for the last decade. And it's the problem of what I'm calling the settler colonial everyday, a way of rendering unremarkable the violence, the rupture, and the work of settler colonialism and translating it into something normal, sustainable, or absolutely nothing for those who've benefited most from it. And maybe unlike a conventional talk drawing from a book, um, I am primarily focused on that book about early settler British Columbia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, but, I, but I thought I would pick up, especially on the, the dialogue, maybe Pacific, but definitely dialogue piece. And I want to put that work I did in the book into a, a conversation with a longer trajectory of the research work that I've been doing uh, to ask some questions that I'm still working my way through. Um, unlike a book that is now finished, I think it, it has left me with questions that I'm now thinking quite differently about. And I'm hoping um, then at the end to ask some larger questions about the relationship between the history that I've been doing and justice for the present and the future. But before I turn to the book in detail, I want to begin uh, where historians are so often comfortable beginning, the archive. And I want to begin in particular with three fragments and flashes of story that span half a century, a few oceans, and several iterations of my research self. In November 1889, English settler Frederick Paget Tommy Norbury wrote to his brother from unceded Tanaha territory, tucked against the Rocky Mountains on the southeastern edge of what's currently called British Columbia. Norbury had arrived there two years earlier, in a moment of particularly intensive colonial change, as the settler state sought to extend its reach into Tanaha territory. The year Norbury arrived was the same year that the province of British Columbia sent Indian Reserve Commissioner Peter O'Reilly to establish reserves, and by extension intended or claimed to open up the rest of Tanaha land to settlers. And he arrived in the same year that the federal government established the Kootenai Indian Agency in response to what they called serious difficulties with Tanaha resistance to settlers and reports of their starvation and poverty due to devastated bison herds on the other side of the mountains. As a newly arrived settler in this context, and particularly as a white English man, Norbury had benefited from these changes, purchasing land from the province and establishing a ranch on it. And amidst all of this rupture and change, both personal and more broadly, he wrote to his brother, a mere snippet of the over 400 pages of family correspondence now archived in Victoria and Fort Steele. And in this letter, Norbury apologized for what he called a rotten letter, but explained, there's absolutely nothing going on here and no news. Nearly six years later in Gilgit, tucked against the Karakoram Mountains on the northwestern edge of South Asia, British military officer William George Lawrence Bainan penned the very same complaint in a letter to his mother. While well, Bainan's career and daily life were embroiled in Britain's ongoing violent campaign to control what they called the Northwest Frontier and win the so-called great game of imperial competition with Russia, Bainan wrote to his mother, absolutely nothing going on here now, everything as flat as ditch water. And then my third fragment, half a century later, in 1944, young hairdressing student Setsuko Fuji wrote from Tegaranto or Toronto to her old school friend Joan Gillis in the Lower Mainland. As Nikijin or a person of Japanese descent, Fuji had been forcibly removed from the Pacific coast two and a half years earlier. After spending time in an internment camp on unceded Tanaha territory, very near Norbury's former ranch, 
her family had moved to Ontario, where they hoped to find an inch less racism and more opportunities in wartime conditions, very much not of their own choosing. There, though, Fuji reported to Gillis, this time in different words, but the same idea. Nothing has turned up, so I'm leading a very dull, monotonous daily routine. So, over the past decade, I've read thousands of personal letters like these. Most, like Norbury's family correspondence to and from Britons in 19th and early 20th century British Columbia, but to a lesser extent, Britons in South Asia, like Benin, and more recently, Nikajin, like Fuji, former settlers on the Pacific coast of British Columbia, displaced elsewhere in mid 20th century Canada. The intentions and questions of these projects have varied, but broadly speaking, my research seeks to understand how this specific place has been made and given meaning through connections with elsewhere, and how settler colonialism and white supremacy in this place have been built, sustained, contested, and changed on the level of intimacy and the everyday. I come to this research as a settler embedded in and benefiting from the legacies of this history. I belong to families that trace their descent on my father's side to Japan via Kanaka Ui territory on Kauai, and on my mother's side to Europe, primarily the United Kingdom, through a long though with a long history of mobility and work across the British Empire, including India. Roughly speaking, I'm Yonsei, a fourth generation, occupying indigenous territories outside of these family home places. I grew up on the territory of the Wasanich and Lekwungen nations on southern Vancouver Island and now live and work here on Musqueam territory. Most of the research in today's talk has been conducted in these places too, though it began in the homeland of my mother's family, London. And there my approach to thinking about these questions around empire and intimacy were really shaped by the scholarly and public conversations that made sense, seemed most urgent in that heart of this former empire. But since returning to British Columbia, this whole talk isn't just a biography, I promise, we're getting it. So since returning to British Columbia, um, my research has followed paths really trying to lead myself back here and, and bring my work back to re-engaging with what makes most sense and seems most urgent from my position here. So one part of this has been interrogating a thread that connects those letters I started with, Norbury, Peinan, and Fuji. And it's one with troubling and tenacious legacies that I see all around me here. While these correspondents were positioned differently in different contexts, and as a historian I'm morally obligated to say that matters very much, they also all shared an epistolary claim to nothing, or nothing going on, in the midst of ongoing intensive violence, inequity, and injustice woven pretty obviously into their lives at the moment of writing. And in their context, they were far from alone in this. Each of these bodies of correspondence is saturated with stock phrases and general apologies about no news, and then specific elaborate descriptions of personal boredom, monotony, and banality. And indeed, this kind of nothing appears so often, so unremarkably, that it easily comes to seem like background noise in the archive epistolary filler to skim on the way to something. But today, I want to stop at nothing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm clearly the only person that thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> so I want to stop at nothing and ask what we might make of it. And I'm interested in this methodologically. I'm interested in how we analyze nothing, banality, silence, and absence. But I'm also really concerned about the work that this nothing does in these contexts of colonialism and white supremacy and violence. So this thread became one of the core pieces of the argument in my book. So I'm going to start by talking about what it looks like there, and then I'm going to jet us forward 50 years. So the book itself seeks to understand what I understand is this really formative period in settler colonial British Columbia. Second half of the 19th century, the first years of the 20th century, really this moment of profound rupture and change. Um, and I, I've approached it through this analysis of British family letters. So in these years, we're talking about an emergent but really fragile and uncertain settler project. And it was premised on white British people who individually and collectively planned to stay, benefit, and belong in British Columbia into an indefinite future. 
And at the core of my work here is the question, what made that possible? What made it possible for Britons to transform themselves into settlers and colonizers? And I begin from the idea that the answer to that question is not obvious and not inevitable, that it takes work to transform uh, themselves in this period into settlers and colonizers. Family letters are among the most widely produced, circulated, and archived sources on this period, and I see them as significant and telling about a privileged but also diverse range of settlers. And through them, I've sought to uncover the personal priorities through which they refracted broader colonial ideologies, and on their own came, within these contexts, came to take for granted the power prospects, comfort, and belonging in British Columbia. And in doing this, I'm partly interested in uh, exploring the ways that settler colonialism as a project and a form of power isn't imposed top down, but is infused in everything in the everyday. So the book itself does this in a number of ways. I'm interested in the postal system uh, and generic conventions of letter writing. I'm interested in trans-imperial family relationships claims of love, uh, responses to death, uh, property conflict, gossip, silence, food. But I'm particularly interested in this in terms of what I call epistolary emotion, the ways that letters claim and perform and talk about uh, emotion in relation to family, but also in relation to settling in British Columbia. That's where I'm going to land today. And I just want to flag, I think there's a lot more to discuss in terms of centering colonizer feelings, which is what I'm about to do. Um, but I, I want to say, first of all, that I don't see this um, as existing in isolation from the critical, radical, decolonial scholarship that uh, it hopefully sits alongside. But, but I also see this as a significant way to understand how settlers made sense of colonizing lives and made them sustainable on this intimate, everyday, personal level. So the scholarship on colonialism and empire has taken this affective turn in recent years, but it's really come to land on focusing on settler anxiety, colonizer fear, and even as one recent collection framed it, imperial panic. The problem is that British family letters were just bored. Um, and I, I see it as possible to read against the grain, read between the lines, find symptoms of repressed anxiety and fear. And I think there's something useful in that. But I think that it, that assumes, A, we know they were afraid, B, we know what that looks like, and C, we're missing what they're actually saying. And so one of the things I'm interested in doing is attending to what literary scholar Sharon Marcus puts is manifest in the surface of these texts. So I argue finally getting to an argument here. In late 19th and early 20th century British Columbia, I see this prevailing banality and boredom of British family letters as both supporting and reflecting a powerful personal normalization of the settler colonial order. And in this, they open a window onto the history of a foundational and enduring settler colonial every day. So let me explain with some examples. Some of this looks like what I would call stock phrases. So, for example, Billy Norbury in 1889 writes to his father, I'm afraid this is not much of a letter, but there's such a scarcity of news around here. His brother would then write, there's really no news. Mary Hawks Moody, another settler, we're going on in such a quiet, same-like sort of way that there's really nothing new to tell you. I could keep you all day with those. Uh, but these claims to no news, I think, do a lot of different work. Sometimes they're comfort for, for distant family. No news is good news. They really work as convention. They show up most often at the beginning of letters, the end of letters, or transitioning between topics. So they work as generic convention. But there's also these more developed place-based descriptions of boredom and banality. And these are often about the gap between expectation or hope or ideal and confronting the reality of colonial routine as a settler. Some focused on conditions of labor, for example. For Edmund Verney, his mid-19th century position as a naval officer on the Pacific coast meant not only prestige and what he hoped would be the glories of a military life in the colony, but also included daily work on the ship, which, as he wrote his father, were, quote, a very great bore. 
After arrival in Vancouver Island in 1858, Robert Burnaby found work as a civil servant, during which time he described his days as filled with, quote, all the government drudgery. Two years later, he began pursuing work as a trader, but then complained about the boredom of that job, too. I'm now doing business, he wrote to his sister Harriet. Comparing this with other apparently more, uh, more exciting colonial opportunities, he explained that doing business meant to, quote, sit at home and sell blankets and other matters day after day. It is not so pleasant, and variety is out of the question. In the early 20th century, aspiring orchardist Daisy Oxley Phillips wrote to her sister that she should now understand her life in the Kootenays as, quote, dull, with no amusements only scenery and hard work. In other cases, it was not hard work, but rather its absence that settler correspondence represented as boring, uninteresting, and dissatisfying. Tommy Norbury wrote to his father in 1888, declaring that his ranch was, quote, a very pretty place, but had absolutely nothing to do. That's somebody who doesn't know how to farm, I think. But. <laughs> um, in 1898, English physician Roger Hicks spent the spring stuck in Glenora trying to get to the Klondike gold fields. He wrote to his daughters, There's little or nothing to do. The shooting is not to be had, and the river is running like a mill race and is much too muddy for fishing. One loafs around to other camps and has a yarn and a smoke, and so the days go on slowly. This doing nothing is worse than the hardest work, as one gets little to read and finds it difficult to pass the time. So that's also somebody who doesn't know hard work. <laughs> that's fine. I'll stop making fun of these people. <clears throat> Others complained of social boredom, so far from their metropolitan norms. Writing from the Royal Engineers Camp near New Westminster, Mary Hawkes Moody worried about her husband, the Colonel, remarking that Richard was, quote, very tired of the monotonous existence we lead here, and as a result has become so low about himself. The colony, she declared, was a dully place for gentlemen the absence of respectable social engagements and entertainment. In another letter, Moody described those whom she called homesick soldiers in the Royal Engineers' camp. These men come in here, she wrote to her sister, and tell me how dull it is, that they have no home, no young ladies, etc., etc. We know from historian Adele Perry's work that British colonial commentators and administrators considered British Columbia's striking gender imbalance amongst its white settler population to be morally and politically unacceptable in these years and dangerous for the future of a white society. But for these men, Moody suggested concerns about race, gender, sex, and heterosociability could be simultaneously anxiety producing and dull. Now, in addition to describing their lives in British Columbia as drearily uneventful, settlers also commented, comment, commented on the corresponding monotony of their letters. And here again, I'm going to um, use Robert Burnaby as an example. In March 1860, Burnaby wrote to his sister Rose, What can I tell you? So little now is our life diversified of any variety of incidents. Two months later, two months later he grumbled to his mother, we have little to vary our dull times. When his family complained that his letters had become extremely boring, uh, he explained uh, this relationship between daily tedium, his struggle to write interesting letters, and the process of settling down and feeling settled in British Columbia. Writing to his brother Tom, for example, he noted, Sally complains that my dispatches are not so lively nor as full of incident as formerly. I'll tell you why. Because we stagnate in a sort of monotonous round, and after describing what seemed new and telling you all about our daily life and so forth, although doubtless one might hourly pick up phrases and anecdotes to amuse you hugely, one gets deadened by the commonplace and has no heart to record what comes day after day and ever the same. Similarly, Burnaby wrote to his sister Harriet, I owe you one in answer to your last long letter, and must rub and scrub up all the odds and ends of news that I can muster. But we subside in a chronic state of rocks, pine trees, and natives, and anything but a wooden street with plank sidewalks and vast seas of mud beyond, and a restless mass of miners always talking and thinking about diggings and nuggets, rockers and sluices, would now appear to us quite beside the order of things. Herein 
other words, Burnaby writes about becoming familiar and settled, framing a colonial landscape and built environment as monotonous. And people who might have, particularly for his distant English relatives, represented a kind of colonial difference, fade into a normalized background that represented an unthreatening, uninteresting, and too familiar place. So I see these as evocative but representative examples of my experiences reading many of these letters, which are full of this kind of daily complaint and just repeating daily lives. Um, I've got a, a chapter in the book on food, and that really came out of the fact that an incredible percentage of these letters just list what they eat every day. And it's a pattern that, if I'm honest, I find infuriating and disturbing. And there's a piece of me that says, how dare they claim over familiarity in a place that they're not familiar with, that they don't know? And how dare they claim boredom with the work that was literally the violence and the, the project to dispossess indigenous peoples. But I see this in my infuriation also as significant. It's ubiquitous in the sources. It's unaccounted for in a scholarship that's much more focused on settler anxiety and fear. And so the question then is, what do I make of nothing? This is what I make of nothing. <laughs> so by telling these kinds of affective stories in their letters, British settlers didn't offer abstracted representations of settler power or the meanings of race, but rather they made claims about their lived experiences in British Columbia through these felt accounts of everyday life in colonial society. And it matters that these show up in letters. Because these letters work to communicate and circulate these ways of understanding settler British Columbia to distant family, friends, and acquaintances. These letters were very um, typically read far beyond the named recipient. And they move in these metropolitan, often in wider imperial trans, uh, global circles. British Columbia was in these years a place on the edge of British familiarity. Uh, it was a place colonized but not much cared about. By producing and circulating these common representations of settler lives, these epistolary descriptions formed a powerful site in which Britons across the world developed and reinforced understandings of British Columbia as settled and settler. And that point might be true of emotion in general, but the particular nature of epistolary boredom and banality matters here too. As literary scholar Patricia Spax explains, boredom is a feeling with the power to, quote, trivialize the world. And more specifically, it's a historically locatable manifestation of trivialization, which, she continues, provides a paradigm of the ordinary and helps elucidate the gradual construction of ordinariness. In other words, here I see epistolary boredom as one form of the settler colonial every day that were to render settler lives as unremarkable and uninteresting in a moment when they were literally being made. By describing their lives as familiar and too familial, <laughs> too familiar, Settlers defined the boundaries and meanings of ordinary life that simultaneously normalized and disregarded the remarkable rupture and violence that they both represented and were enacting in early settler British Columbia. And that brings me to the second piece of this conversation about boredom that I see as really important. Epistolary boredom has silences built into it, and this is a particularly powerful form of trivialization. The unremarkable goes hand in hand with the unremarked. As they claim boredom in their letters, these settlers remained almost entirely silent on the topic of indigenous peoples, uh, the relationships between indigenous peoples and settlers, and uh, much of what has come to dominate the, the literature on colonialism here. We know that settlers' lives were entangled in a daily way with indigenous peoples. And the silence here is also surprising, given that we could expect a, a very strong metropolitan British interest in indigenous peoples as that marker of colonial difference at the very least. But these letters say almost nothing about indigenous peoples. Now, 
I want to be super, super clear. I don't interpret that as meaning indigenous people were not important or not present. But I see this as a particular kind of silencing. As settlers make these epistolary claims to boredom or to the unremarkable, these work as political acts of narration and performances of affective power that erase the settler colonial processes and trivialized both its forms and its consequences. In other words, embedded in this pattern, I see the familiarity through which British settlers came to be at home with the colonial order in British Columbia. Okay, so that is one of the core arguments that I develop uh, in the book. So the book came out and it exists now. Um, I can change it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided this summer that I was going to take a, a short little diversion into a small article length project. Looking at a collection of Nikkei or Japanese Canadian teenagers' letters that were recently donated to UBC Rare Books and Special Collections. And this is a collection of just over six dozen letters written um, by Japanese Canadian teenagers, most of whom were born here in the Lower Mainland, uh, who were forcibly removed from the Pacific Coast uh, in early 1942 uh, when the Canadian state. Uh, decided that, that people of Japanese descent, Nikijin, could, could not be in this area following um, Pearl Harbor. It's much more to say about that history. Um, at the core, these letters were written to an old school friend of theirs, Hakujin, a, a white teenager, Joan Gillis, who remained in the Lower Mainland and maintained this really rich epistolary connection with a number of uh, her former classmates who'd been removed. So obviously this is a very different historical context from the bulk of my research work. And I'm moving here uh, from letters written by those most empowered by an emergent settler system to racialized settlers experiencing an immediate form of state oppression in a more established settler system. This is not a historical context I've ever intended to work on. <laughs> um, but as a historian of settler colonials, I'm kind of dipping my toe into this. I also owe much and take inspiration from particularly the Nikkei scholars who've done critical work on Asian settler colonialism. For example, in the American and Hawaiian context, uh, Candice Fuk uh, Fujikane, Jonathan Okamura, Aiko Day, who I believe was here last year. Um, uh, and in the Canadian context, to my PhD student, Nicole Yakashiro, who I think is really leading that work in thinking about Asian Canadian settler colonialism. And I'm not stealing your fields, I'm not <laughs> scooping your work. No, I can't. Um, so I've drawn a lot of inspiration from that. Um, I also really didn't plan to work on letters, I was done with letters. Um, but. <laughs> Then this collection got donated here and I got entangled in it. And as a number of students in here know, um, I taught with this collection and a number of the people in this room uh, transcribed some of those letters last year. And teaching with that collection also made me read those letters. And then I was increasingly compelled by them. And so uh, one of the things that really struck me thinking about my interest in histories of emotion is that this period of Japanese Canadian history is usually told or imagined as a history of sadness and anger, maybe stoicism. But these feelings have come to symbolize and seem to confirm and measure the injustice of internment and its traumatic effects on Nikkei communities. But again, not to be predictable, but reading this collection of letters, I was struck by really similar strains of the same kind of unremarkability, meaning something very different in a different historical context. So again, some of this I read as markers of that genre, uh, as markers of a widely shared culture of personal letter writing. Sumi Moditsune, for example, in July 1942, writing from a sugar beet farm uh, in uh, Raymond, Alberta, started her letter, it's so peaceful and quiet and nothing happens here, so I haven't much to write you. This might have actually reflected her feelings or it might not have, it certainly didn't, she then wrote an entire letter, so she found something to say, but this is a really classic form of that generic convention. Others are those kinds of place-based, context-based complaints about uh, living conditions and working conditions, but again with very different resonance than white Britons in that early settler context. Just one example, in February 1943, Masao Ujie wrote to Gillis about their mutual friend Bruce, who was then at basic training, and then perhaps contrasting his life with Bruce's turned to a personal update. Nothing changes here, he wrote, just like a clock. Work, eat, 
sleep, work, eat, sleep, boring? You bet. And here, uh, working in uh, orchards in the Okanagan, UJ was, was writing about conditions of work very much not of his own choosing, but also about that process of making a routine out of those conditions. And what else is there to say? Like early settler letters, indigenous people uh, are also alighted uh, almost entirely in this correspondence. And the other thing that struck me, and, and I think particularly the students in the class, was a really uh, how rare it was to even mention internment conditions and to talk about state violence causing this mass uprooting of their young lives. And there's very few clear traces of that kind of anger and sadness that have come to dominate stories about Japanese Canadian internment. And I would use as an example about um, uh, an example of this. A, a number of the sources in the collection are postcards, and for me, these are some of the most disturbing in the collection. Um, they're usually the first uh, piece of, of mail that these Nikkei teenagers sent to Gillis right after, um, usually en route to an internment camp or a sugar beet farm. Um, and I'll, I'll read you a couple of examples just to give you a sense of what I mean by disturbing. So, April 1942, Sumi Moritsune uh, sent a postcard from Kamloops. On the front, there's a picture of Kamloops. And on the back, she wrote, I'm having a wonderful time and getting along fine. The scenery is very interesting and beautiful. I wish you were here with me. I think this is all for now. More news next time. Give my best regards to your father and mother. As another example, Alberta Hama sent a postcard uh, with a picture of Alexandria Bridge on it, um, the, the quote-unquote colonial engineering marvel uh, built by John Trutch of Trutch family colonial badness. Um, that's a side note. That's just connecting them. Um, so Ohama and his postcard wrote, Hi, Joan. Having a swell trip. Lots of people, but not crowded. Not alone, but lonesome. Train's awful jerky. I will write later. Beautiful scenery. Sure miss the old gang, Al Ohama. There's a lot of issues to consider in the production and circulation of these postcards and, and the letters more generally. Some of this has to do with individual letter writers' relationship with Gillis. It's very clear that some were very close friends with her and others weren't. Um, but there's also the looming shadow here of state censorship of the post. A number of these letters arrived marked, uh, examined by censor. And in their letters, it's very clear that they're aware that the state censor is reading this correspondence. Postcards were especially vulnerable. They weren't only read uh, if they were selected by the official censor, but they could be read by the delivery person, uh, the postal clerk, any number of other people. So I think there's a lot to say in the choice of what is being said. And for me, it's almost impossible not to read into these postcards. Not a kind of stoicism, but the heartbreak of what's repressed for these teenagers who only have the language of wish you were here in talking about um, their forced wrenching from the coast by a white supremacist state. But there's also something to be said here for what's manifest on the surface of this correspondence. This post produced and moved material and textual traces of a claim to an internment every day. We can't mistake that everydayness for acceptance of those conditions, nor can we take the emotional performance of these teenagers in these letters as a measure of justice, concluding that this was not that bad. Rather, I think we should read these as teenagers trying to make sense of their experiences and normalize them into something livable in wartime white supremacist settler contexts, while using the post and a friendship to maintain a lifeline to a place and a normal they once called home. So I'm still thinking through where I want to go to that. That's a lot of um, research threads that are kind of open stitching. I'm not a sewer, so that metaphor didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, but uh, so in part, this is a, this is a, I'm looking forward to this conversation about where I take this. But for now, I want to use this as a launch pad to conclude with some points and questions about how we think about violence being lived in the everyday and what kind of work historicizing this everyday might do for justice in present and future. And I have some preliminary thoughts on this. I'm very interested in what you think. So as a historian and a person, not mutually exclusive categories, um, I'm surrounded by and embedded in the legacies of these histories. 
I'm conscious of the deep familiarity and power of what I see as a settler colonial every day for those who enact and benefit from that kind of disregard built into Canada's foundations. I'm also concerned about the uses and sometimes abuses of Nikkei wartime history in the present. In public conversations about internment today, I see it held up as a kind of ultimate injustice in Canada. A bad event, but a closed dark chapter. But I see that holding up of Japanese Canadian internment, internment as an ultimate injustice as a form of model minoritization that is often also used against Indigenous and Black people for whom the violence of settler colonialism and white supremacy has been less easily confined to a single crisis point. And so I think there's also a particular responsibility here in bringing together these, these threads of my research, but also contemporary concerns, with thinking about how we engage with injustice and inequity and violence that operates at the level of what Rob Nixon called slow violence, but I might frame here as the relentlessness and eventlessness of that violence. And I think there's a struggle to respond to violence and inequity and injustice that's so woven into the everyday and so normalized. Particularly those who benefit most from it struggle to even recognize it. And so I want to ask, can thinking historically do good here? It's colonial discipline in a colonial institution, I have not managed to divest myself from that. But I see it also as having some promise here. On a basic level, stitching these different projects together, I see a really pow powerful reminder of that historian's truth, context matters. There's something in these letters that seems familiar and shared, and I think some of that is about, for example, a shared culture of letter writing. But they also demand that we engage with the differences in those contexts and recognize different people's experiences and perspectives in that context, including what is not said. But I think hist thinking historically here also offers us this beautiful combination of critical understanding and hope. Because history allows us, it's one of the tools that allows us to step outside of our own normal. I'm using our here quite loosely. Um, to step outside of what has become taken for granted today or so embedded in our normal that it's difficult to see. History offers us tools to make visible again what's been rendered invisible, to make remarkable what's been rendered unremarkable or unremarked, to remember that this is not inevitable. What has been made can also be unmade. And in this, I'm thinking about settler colonialism as this project of violence and inequity designed to endure. And if we want it to not endure, we have to do a lot of things, but we have to, in part, attend to emotion and the everyday and the intimate. What's become a collective performance and claim of unremarkable and common sense. And I'm building here, I, I hope in fairly obvious ways, on people who've done a lot more thinking on this, including Sarah Ahmed, and thinking about the cultural politics of emotion. But I want to add boredom into the mix there, as an individual, but especially a growing collective power to trivialize inequity, violence, and one's role or place in it. Because normalizing it is part of what makes it sustainable. So that's a kind of sweeping tapestry of where I've been. And I, I hope I'm not making analytical mountains out of archival molehills here. But I think where, where I really want to end is this. Methodologically and analytically, but most importantly, politically, I think we're in a place right now where it is an absolute urgent imperative that we figure out how to make something of nothing. Thanks. Plenty of time for questions, um, just under 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, will you be okay fielding? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks, Jiffy. Yeah. Um, maybe this is a question that could actually be answered in the Moments of like 
otherwise what you might find political instability or crisis. Yeah, like yeah. I'm imagining that like wartime letters would yeah. sometimes be like, I'm bored as hell. Oh yeah. So at what, yeah. when does like boredom emerge as a genre that is like very often alongside big moments of crisis or yeah. change? Yeah. Well, you know, the, one of those three threads that I started, the thread that I dropped really quickly because I, I have no business talking about it, is that with the letter from, from uh, Lawrence Bain on, in, on the Northwest frontier in South Asia. And that's a really, he was in war. He was in war. Uh, he was leading um, a British war project, and he was bored. And there is actually there's a scholarship on military boredom as like a very real thing. And and so in thinking about boredom, I think there's a um, it, it has emerged uh, as a, a way of thinking about the gap between expectation and experience, and uh, particularly the the ways in which many things can become routine. And so I, I think in, the, in some ways this is at the heart of also what I'm thinking about in terms of this early settler period. Um, these are people who are, I would also call them living in pretty significant instability and change. And um, yeah, I think it's right at the heart of that. And I think it's a way of, of making it, um, making it routine. And, and this is something, y you know, this is, <laughs> I, I, I think one of the things I start with in this is this is a familiar impulse, right? Um, I, I see, I recognize in these letters that, that impulse to be bored despite the fact that there are things happening that, that are not boring, right? And so this is not, I, I think in some, I'm sort of spinning off from your actual question here, but I'm gonna say this nonetheless, while the rest of you think of your questions. Um, I, I think the other thing that, that's kind of at the heart of this is that it, it's not so much um, a story about colonialism uh, or war as like there's bad people and there's good people, um, but that these kinds of things that are understandable impulses or feelings do work. And I think when we see them in these letters and the ways that they circulate, they, they are constructing British knowledge about British Columbia in a way that other sources really weren't. And so it's not, for me, it's not so much like, I don't care if they were bored or not. <laughs> and um, I, I'm not actually trying to say that, but, but I think one of the things I really want to focus on is the work that it does when any of us do that. Yeah. Did I? Yeah. Thanks, Aisha. Um, can you? Can I just ask for one? Can Can you say more about the shift in? T I I I see a lot of shifts in tone. I want to know what shift in yeah, tone so you I heard. Like, I mean, so I actually think you, you were talking about your boss biography. Yeah. Like, don't worry, I won't talk about it. Like, oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Laughing, yeah. You know, your of course. Uh-huh, yeah. In a way that I didn't feel the same yeah. way. That's great, thanks. Um, okay, I'll start with the epistolary culture piece. So um, the, the particular epistolary culture I'm talking about in the, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, this is this moment of uh, huge expansion for uh, British people in terms of who's writing letters, who's writing familial letters, uh, and, and how often. And part of that um, is 
uh, really shaped by uh, postal reforms uh, that start within the United Kingdom in the first couple of, a couple of decades into the 19th century and then spread imperial wide, which, which make it a much, much more accessible uh, system to, to, to use regularly. It's also connected with changing literacy rates uh, within the United Kingdom as well. And one of the things that happens there is you get the expansion and the reinforcement of uh, a culture of personal famili familial and friendship uh, letter writing among British people in the 19th century that builds on, of course, the kinds of letter writing conventions and practices earlier, but, but really becomes uh, a much larger and, and increasingly taught in schools. Uh, we see the flourishing of letter writing manuals, which I think were often read as a kind of like, I don't know, social pornography more than like instruction. They, they have sample letters that are kind of scandalous, but um, we do see the emergence of, of like a, a, a more widely shared knowledge of how to write a letter and why you write a letter and what that looks like. And I see it, for example, um, uh, one of the families that I've read their letters, um, they, they are, um, I would say, of uh, m more limited uh, literacy in the way, in, in at least letter writing um, practice. And the first letters um, that the mother sends, she signs love mom or love Mother, the love, love mom. I think it's love mom. Um, and then very quickly she starts signing it like ever your most affectionate mother. And so there's this like learning of particular convention that I see reinforced pretty quickly in these letters. Are we in an epistolary culture now? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think like for me at least, I see it as building and transforming. I'm not one of those people that, that uh, I mean, we're always in crisis, I guess. Um, but the kind of texting, emailing uh, changes in convention, I don't see really so much as crisis. And I actually see much more connection to the 19th century epistolary culture than expected. I, I on almost every familial email, like every letter I send to my parents, I say, I don't have much to tell you. Uh, right, and so I, I think we we borrow from this culture, um, but yeah, I, I also see different conventions, and, and I see those conventions changing for sure. Um, I see lots of hands, but I want to talk about myself. So um, I have tons to say about that, um, and you you hit something that I think is really important, and that I'm still um, I'm still grappling with. And and my answer to it might actually be the opposite of what you're expecting, <laughs> um, which is that my, uh, in terms of my own positionality in this, I, I am of Japanese descent, but I'm not, I'm the first generation of my family born in Canada. And uh, the Japanese side of my family was in Hawaii in the war. And so we're not, the, my immediate family was not interned. And so um, this is a whole larger fraught thing that many people in this room have heard me talk about in terms of my relationship to the Japanese Canadian community and the ways in which Japanese Canadian history is often reduced to, boiled down to experiences of internment that, I, that just doesn't match, I don't fit in. And actually, personally, I'm much, one of the reasons, I mean, I, there's many reasons why I never intended to work in this area. Um, but one of them is I, I kind of feel like I have no business. I feel like people think I have business. Um, in my discipline, in my field in Canadian history, um, I have battled for years to try to convince people that I don't work in Japanese Canadian history. I am one of the least white Canadian historians that it is. And um, I, I, despite the fact that I tell colleagues over and over again I don't do this, it's the vast majority of manuscript review requests that I get, which raises lots of questions about expert peer review. Um, it's the vast majority of graduate supervision requests I get. And, and so one of my, now I'm really like going off on this, but one of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons I'm hesitant to work in the field is actually in terms of my own relationship with the specific history I'm writing about, I don't feel like I have business talking about it in the way that I actually feel like I have business talking about British, white British settlers, um, who, who I feel both much closer to and much less concerned about my relationship to that, um, to that community and that history and much less concerned about the, the power relationships within that. So um, the shift in tone actually might be my own hesitation um, and my own caution in the analysis. I see lots of questions. That we will talk forever about this, eh, Shepard? <laughs> um, I saw one at the back, yeah. Yeah. What kind of response do you get from those, yeah. like, um, those relatives and friends 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I can, I can partly answer that question and partly not. And part of it is the story of the archive, where very often I'm reading one half of the correspondence. In different families, it's different halves of it, but I very rarely have the back and forth. So I can speculate based on the, the occasions which I have the other half of the correspondence. Um, and it's a mix. They complain. Like we see this in Robert Burnaby's like, desperate explanation of being deadened by the commonplace. They're complaining that his letters are boring. Right? Like, um, and one of the patterns we see, usually the very first letter they send is full of this like enthusiasm. And often they declare, like, I will never bore of this place. And then they're like, next letter is like, ugh. <laughs> and so I think like their families get this first letter that's like 16 pages long and full of these like stories that they're telling. And then, um, so they complain. Um, but they also, for those who don't complain, they say, it's better that you write. Like, please write. I don't care if you don't think you have anything to say, write. Because for a lot of these families, they're never going to see each other again. And if they are going to see each other again, it's going to be a really long time. And so the, the post becomes family beyond kind of memory and imagination. And for those who want to maintain familial contact, not everybody does, um, it, it really becomes like, I, I don't care. Like, just like send me one line that says I still don't have anything to say. We know you're alive. Because one of the things that happens is that when people don't write letters, their families don't know if they're alive. And so um, there, I would say a mixture of like complaining and that's fine, whatever, call your mom anyways, like that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I saw it, Jessica. Yeah, um, since I think we've done kind of, I've, I'm back in the 18th century, but yeah. I think we've read a lot of the same kinds of sources because yep. I also look at letters. Yeah. Um, and you know, I wasn't looking for empty spaces. I was, yeah. I was looking for events, yeah. and yeah. so, and, and sometimes you do. So mm -hmm. it's interesting, because, right? You go in na naturally looking yeah. for yeah. the juicy stuff, yeah. like you want, because you want to talk totally. history, right? Yeah. So I was thinking, did you do any kind of thinking about quantifying, like mm -hmm. what percentage of the letters mm -hmm. were like boredom and mm -hmm. nothing, and what mm -hmm. percentage were actually you things? things? <laughs> and and then you know the people who did speak, because some people yeah. do talk about things, because yeah. that's how historians know things, yeah. right? Yeah. At least that letters are one source of how yeah. we know things. So um, you know it would be interesting to compare, like the people who actually did notice, yeah. the people who did comment yeah. on the things that we today think are noteworthy yeah. Yeah. or are count as real events yeah. versus the people who didn't yeah. and why the difference, yeah. you yeah. know, I would just yeah. yeah. Um, so, no, so I first started reading family letters as a grad student, and I was under the impression as a grad student that one needed to have a topic. Um, and so my intention <laughs> when I started reading these letters was that I was looking for a thing. And um, what, what the book does, each chapter takes a, a different lens, a different thematic lens. Um, and I mean, they're different things, I guess. Um, but what I found is there just simply isn't enough where they're talking about the kind of thing that I think you're talking about. Um, these are not letters about events. And there, there's this kind of historian like obsession with events, which is why I emphasize the eventlessness of this kind of violence. There's no single moment. And, um, Th they're not really talking about those things. I didn't quantify, um, but I, I would say like it's a tiny percentage that is that kind of thing. And what really started to feel was if I was, if I was doing that kind of analysis, I was uh, kind of can cannibalizing is not the right word. I'm not a letter, but I was uh, like taking this one tiny piece out and completely ignoring the rest. And that's really what that move to um, settler anxiety in the scholarship felt like for me. That, that scholarship is great, and they're looking at other sources, but like if I tried to apply that to these, it didn't fit. And the scholarship on settler colonialism here and elsewhere focuses on indigenous settler state relations, it focuses on race and violence and land. Those are central. And it really felt inauthentic to me as a methodology because it's that small of a piece. And I talk about that in the book. Like I, I talk about the exceptions. I don't think there's a pattern as to why. Like there are, re there are individual reasons. I don't have enough examples to tell you that there's a broader pattern. Are we out of time? I think we are. Okay. I hate to Sorry. stop the fabulous uh, conversation, but uh, there is a class happening at 1. Um, uh, which Laura has uh, kindly also uh, agreed to uh, be a part of. Uh, so uh, let's give Laura a big round of applause.